Uh, I found the button. Okay, I'm recording now. Great. Uh, yeah, then I think I'll just get started. Yeah. Um, can you see my screen? Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, well, title of my thesis was predicting particle dynamics using close grain fields. Um, this is pretty much a description of what I did. Uh, yeah, I'll start with what coarse graining is in general. Uh, it's a method to compute continuous fields uh, from a set of discrete particles. So we have uh, the, the particles with their positions are i and their properties ai. And then we have this formula, which basically the whole thesis revolves around, which we call the, the fundamental coarse graining equation. And this is what we use to compute these continuous fields. Uh, it can be written as a convolution instead, if we introduce the field A prime, which is basically a field where we treat every particle as point-like, we give them a delta distribution. And if we introduce this point-like field, then the whole uh, fundamental cost graining equation can be written as this convolution. This was pretty useful in doing some some proofs in the thesis. Uh, I won't go over too much of the, the mathematics behind them though in, in this uh, presentation. So this cost graining function phi, uh, we, we do have some requirements for it. Uh, first of all, it should be positive because it kind of represents uh, well, a distribution of our particles in a sense. Uh, and that doesn't make sense to be negative in, in any point. Uh, it should also be normalized so that the total properties of the particles are conserved in the close grain field. Uh, it should be smooth. This is not strictly necessary. It is only necessary if we want to use the, the derivative, uh, which we use for the, the strain field and the strain rate field. And with those requirements, oh, uh, yeah, right. It should also depend only on the distance because we have isotropic systems. Uh, the, the physics don't change no matter what direction we look in. And also our particles are spherical. So we want a cost grain function that only depends on the distance uh, yeah, between the point and the particle. With that in mind, we define two different cost grain functions. One is the heavy side function. So we just have the heavy side with uh, a radius, which is here is W and the distance. So uh, it's, uh, this is one within a sphere of distance W around the point. And then we have this factor in the beginning which is just for normalization. Uh, we also define a Gaussian coarse grain function. We actually use this quite a lot more because, well, it, it is smooth compared to the heavy side function, which is not smooth. So we just have the exponential with minus the distance squared. We, div we divide by uh, this parameter w again uh, squared. And this well, if you write in this form, W is basically the standard deviation, except that because we're dealing with a three-dimensional Gaussian, the prefactor uh, to normalize the whole thing is a little different. So omega is, is very similar to a standard deviation, but it's not exactly what you'd call standard deviation. Uh, we, we also call this parameter W the coarse grain width or just characteristic width. Uh, the choice of this parameter is very important. Here in, on the left, you can see we calculate the field at this point R, and we imagine the heavy side function, which has this boundary, this circle, and there's three particles within it. And there's also this particle to the right, which is like almost in it. Uh, parts of it are in it, but the center point of the particle is not. So that particle does not contribute to the field at R at all. And example for, uh, for example, R2, that one lies partially outside of the cross-grain region. 
but because the center point is within it, uh, well, the, the it, it is as if the whole particle were within the coarse grain region. Uh, that also shows how important the correct choice of this uh, characteristic with W is, because if we have a huge particle, for example, and we don't change our coarse graining width, then it can happen that the particle almost completely covers the coarse grain region, or if it was even larger, it can completely cover the region without cont contributing to the field at that point at all, because we only look at the particle centers. Uh, yeah, this can also be illustrated in another way because we're using uh, cross graining functions that only depend on the distance. They are symmetric in the particle position and the field position at which we calculate the field. We can flip those around and then we can imagine this thing where we have multiple points where we have cross grain regions uh, instead as a particle which has the coarse grain region around it, and we just look at the points where we want to calculate the particle. And this shows, well, it's it's not really a problem. It shows, uh, it's rather used as a feature more often that the particle size, which is the smaller gray circle, uh, is misrepresented because we have this much larger circle around it, the cross grain region. And this also means that no matter what the size of the actual particle is, they will all be treated as having this exact same shape and size. Uh, this is often desirable because we cross graining, well, as the name suggests, we want to replace finer particles with more coarse particles. And um, this is basically the idea idea behind it, I, I'd say. Uh, there is, however, another issue. That is because we uh, we cannot calculate the field at every point in practice. Uh, we, we can only compute it at a number, a finite number of points, which are the values of those points we call uh, H, uh, no, A tilde. Uh, and we, we want to have an appro approximation, which is the field A, A tilde, which is as close po as possible to the true field A, but that we can compute from only this finite number of values. So this two-step process, like the first step is called discretization. We reduce the infinite data points to not a finite number of, of data points. And then in the next step, which is the interpolation, uh, we use these uh, finite data points to compute the fields in between, uh, make it continuous again. And well, I guess we could also compute it with out, uh, outside of whatever region we define. In that case, it would be extrapolation with interpolation. But in essence, we uh, create a continuous field again from this finite data. Uh, yeah, so how we calculate those finite data points is uh, we simply sample the true cost graining field for which we have a formula in a finite number of points. And then we use nearest neighbor interpolation to calculate the field, uh, like the approximated field at any point we want. So like those two steps would be we take this point, for example, in, in the center. We this is one of the finite data points. Like those are all the points drawn here. We calculate the field value at all of those by doing the coarse grain for which we have the coarse grain function illustrated by this circle. Uh, we see that a particle lies in that region. It will contribute to the field in that point, and then we have a value for that point. And in the second step, in the nearest neighbor interpolation, we can look at any point, say uh, up here. And then we, we simply look at the data point, which we have that is closest to that point. And that gives rise to those uh, quadratic or cubical cells. 
uh, within which the values are uh, the same everywhere. This, however, causes a problem. Uh, that is, for example, if we take the particle and move it up by half a cell, it will now contribute to four cells instead, at least if we use the heavy side function. So the amount that this particle contributes to the overall field in total suddenly doubles simply by moving the particle half a cell. So the, the field totals, they suddenly become uh, dependent on the particle positions. And this is only the case because of how we discretize our data. So, oh yeah, uh, like in other words, the, the field totals are not conserved from the continuous coarse grain field to the approximation. Uh, we have an alternative approach that can fix this issue. And that is we, uh, the, the center points, we give them the mean value throughout the cell of the true field. So what we have here is we take the true field, we integrate it over the entire cell, we divide by the cell volume, and that is the mean value throughout the cell. And if we then uh, use nearest neighbor interpolation again, we assume the same value throughout the cell, uh, then the total value throughout the cell will just be the mean times the volume, which is then, of course, the, the correct total volume. And that ensures that using this formula, we have, uh, we conserve the field totals when going from the coarse grain field to the approximated field. This integral, however, uh, like this first one, this can be hard to compute. Uh, we, it, it's not computable in general, uh, at least not analytically, but we can make some, some limitations. Uh, we can say that the particles are homogeneous, that their properties are uh, distributed throughout the particle uh, like homogeneously. And then the integral just becomes the intersection volume, which is like PI and uh, represents the particle volume and CJ the, uh, the cell. And the whole integral is then the volume of intersection between the particle and the given cell. And then we still have those factors uh, in front for uh, like to normalize it. Uh, and this is much more manageable to compute. Uh, it can be approximated uh, arbitrarily closely, but we limit ourselves to using a single cube for a particle. Of course, this is usually not the case, uh, but the intersection between a sphere and a cell that is not, uh, well, not easily computable in general. So we instead just use a simple cube. Uh, this makes the computations much faster, uh, even though it does cost uh, in accuracy of the approximation, but we are fine with that because we were focusing mainly on the speed of the computation. And then we can also take this factor V and pull it out of the sum that makes the algorithms in the end a little faster. Yeah, this is what I just said. So <clears throat> now that we have this fundamental cost grain function, we can define several fields with it by simply inserting different properties of the particle. We can use the mass, for example, instead of this arbitrary property A, uh, the rest remains the same. So we have the mass field. We can do the same for vector fields or even tensor fields. Uh, then we have just a vector instead of A. Uh, we do that for mass momentum. We have the kinetic stress. Uh, the kinetic stress of a single particle is simply defined as the outer product of velocity and momentum. And then we can calculate the kinetic stress field. And we also have the mass displacement, which is a kind of a weird quantity. It's simply the displacement of the particle from uh, a given reference time point multiplied by the mass. We don't really use this quantity directly. We use it to compute other fields later on. So those are all the fields we calculate from the particles with this very same equation. We do, however, have some more fields. Uh, first of all, are some contact fields, which use the very same equation, but instead of particle positions and particle properties, 
they use contact positions and contact properties, but except for that, it's uh, exactly the same equation. Uh, an example of that is the contact stress, which is very similar to the kinetic stress actually, and if you write it in this form. Uh, then we have derived fields. For example, the velocity field, you calculate them from other fields that you have computed previously. Uh, the velocity, for instance, is just uh, the momentum field divided by the mass field. And then lastly, we have derivative fields. They depend on the derivative or the gradient of the cross graining function. And then instead of the simple product, we have now the outer product. Except for that, it's a uh, very similar equation. An example for that is the deformation tensor, the symmetrization of which then in the end gives the strain, uh, strain tensor. And all of those fields that we have defined with the conventional cross graining, they can also be defined with the mean value discretization. I won't go over them again. Uh, changes very little. Uh, you will see it in the algorithms pretty clearly though. Uh, so the algorithms, the first one is just the standard cross graining. We want to implement this equation. And the naive way of doing that would be to loop over all the points at which we want to calculate the field, then loop over all the particles. And then lastly, or wherever loop over all the different properties of the particle. Uh, that is however not very efficient because then we have to uh, loop over all particle cell pairs. And we can simplify that a lot uh, or make it a lot more optimize it a lot uh, because those loops, we can uh, swap them around into any order we want. So we put the uh, loop over the particles on the very outside. This is the very, very outer loop. And then we introduce a cutoff region because we know that for the coarse graining functions that we use, uh, for example, the, the uh, Gaussian, after a certain distance, the contribution to the fields, they will become negligible, neg uh, negligibly small. So we introduced this cutoff C, uh, which is, I, I think I chose three times the standard deviation uh, that should contain something like 99% of the overall particle. And we uh, compute the, the boundary of a box uh, which is the, the cutoff region. So we calculate the, the position of the particle minus this cutoff and uh, for, uh, plus the cutoff. Those are the minimum and the mount, maximum boundaries of the box throughout which we have to calculate the values. We divide by the grid spacings. And if we cast the whole thing to an integer then, uh, which is basically just rounding, uh, rounding down, we get the indices to the, the cells throughout which we uh, calculate the values. So now we don't loop over all the cells, but only over those within the cutoff region. So we go from lambda minus to lambda plus. And this, well, those are vectors. Uh, in practice, this would be three loops, uh, one over X, one over Y, and one over Z, uh, or in higher dimensions even more. But here, uh, I think writing it as a single loop makes it clearer. Then we calculate the actual value of the cross graining function. We, we store it in this temporary value, uh, capital Phi. And then we loop over all the properties of the particles and the fields uh, at the very end, because we can use the same value Phi for all of those properties. So we can reuse it. Uh, and then we just add the contributions, which is just the particle value times this cost graining function uh, to the fields. And this is how we get the overall fields. It's important to set the fields to zero at the start, but I omitted that here in this uh, description. So that is the, the algorithm for the standard cross graining. We can modify it very slightly uh, to get the algorithm for uh, for the derivative fields that use the gradient. So here you can see uh, it's only lines seven and 10 that really change. So the formula we have, instead of the product with phi, we now have the outer product with the gradient of phi. So that is what we calculate here. 
And this, of course, is a vectorial quantity because the gradient is vectorial. And instead of the product, which we add to the field, we now add the outer product. But except for that, it's, it's really the same. And lastly, we have the algorithm for the mean value discretization, which is again, the very same as the standard, uh, standard coarse graining, except for line seven, uh, where we calculate this weight, which, which uh, the particles contribute to the field. Uh, this is a little different. Uh, this is basically just what, what we have in this formula here, except for the sum. And it looks very daunting if you don't really know what it is, but this is still just the intersection volume between uh, the particle, which we approximate as a cube and the cell. Uh, and this is actually very easy to compute. And then we just divide by those two factors. Uh, yeah, with those algorithms in place, we can apply them to a simulation. Um, can you see this video? Yeah, we can. Okay, good. Yeah, uh, yeah this is the simulation I used as a test case. Uh, it's just a rotating drum filled with lots of particles. And we can use the algorithms I've just described to calculate the fields. So the most intuitive is probably the mass. Uh, play the video as well. So I think this is pretty much what we expect. Uh, there's high mass density in the pile where it gets transported up and the, the density gets lower as uh, we go to the top where the particles then move down. Uh, we also have some other scalar fields, the pressure, which is pretty interesting because this occurs mostly in the surface flow. And we also have, uh, which is actually our last scalar field, uh, the Formesis stress or stress Formesis, uh, which is, this one looks very chaotic. I think the values are high whenever like a fast moving particle collides with something stationary. Uh, so yeah, we, we don't, really draw a lot of conclusions from from that we can also plot some of the vector fields uh, the momentum field is probably the the easiest to understand so here we have the x y and z component and where the particles are carried to the left we have negative values here shown in red and where the particles move down they obtain a positive velocity in x direction so those are blue and there's a thin boundary layer where they basically don't move in that direction. Uh, basically, the opposite is true for the Z component, uh, which is in our case up. Uh, so the particles on the left of the drum, they get carried up. They tend to have a positive Z, Z, uh, Z velocity. And the particles that roll down, obviously, they have a negative component in that direction. Uh, with that and the mass field, we can compute the velocity field. So this one actually looks very similar to the momentum field, but it looks kind of blocky. Uh, this is because like where there are no particles whatsoever, the value is undefined because we basically divide zero momentum by zero mass. So that could take any value. And those blocks, they occur uh, because those are the cutoff regions of the outermost particles. Apart from that, uh, well, looks very similar to, to the momentum field. And you will see that the Y component of both of those fields is very small uh, compared to the other components. You can also play the video. Uh, it's basically small throughout the whole simulation. And that is because Y, uh, the axis along the drum, uh, there's just not, not a lot of movement there. Uh, we can go one step further and also plot tensor fields. There's only one tensor field, which kind of looks interesting, which is the strain rate field, uh, which is the, the deformation, uh, the symmetrization of the deformation tensor or the deformation rate tensor. Uh, so this is symmetric. You will see the top right will be exactly the same as the bottom left. And yeah, this is a little harder to interpret than momentum, for example. Uh, basically what it shows you is how uh, 
particles move against each other. Uh, and we can also play the video. Yeah, uh, we, we don't try to uh, interpret this data alone a lot. Uh, we use those fields in the later parts of the thesis though. So one more thing before I come to the prediction part of the thesis is uh, I want to get back to this non-conservation of particle totals uh, with the conventional cross-graining, uh, which we have shown in theory that it's not conserved. I've also done some experiments on that with this simulation. And you can see this green line. This is the total mass of the cross-grained field. And you can see it fluctuates uh, quite a bit, especially in the beginning where the particles first drop into the drum. And then there's just this steady fluctuation. We also have this blue line at the very top, which is very straight. Uh, this is the value we obtain with the mean value discretization. And then we have the red line, which is basically covered by the blue line, which is the true total mass of the particles. So we've just shown that the theoretical uh, thing, we, we, uh, the theoretical non-conservation is also true in practice. Okay, then we move on to the prediction part of the uh, thesis where we use a neural network to predict particle motion. Uh, particle motion in general, we can describe from one time step to, or from one point in time to any arbitrary other point in time as the current position plus a displacement. And this displacement depends on the time and also on the end time or the time step. Uh, we can, uh, to, we can write this as a Taylor series. So we have the particle's current position plus the velocity times the difference in time. And then we have higher order terms, uh, acceleration, jerk, uh, however the higher order terms are then called. Uh, yeah, those depend on the time step to the square and higher order. And if we write this with discrete time steps, we can write it as the position after a time step, our prime is the current run plus the velocity times delta t, uh, the time step plus k, which we use to encapsulate all the nonlinear terms. Uh, we call this k the displacement deviator because it is the deviation of the displacement from uniform motion. And the objective for the machine learning part is to predict this displacement deviator because we know v uh, for every particle at every point in time. We don't have to predict that for now. So uh, I used a neural network. Uh, it's pretty small one actually. So we have like three output nodes which correspond to the components of the displacement deviator k. And then we have four hidden layers uh, of, well, if we're going from input to output and decreasing size, and the input layer, which I'll get to it uh, in a bit. So this input layer, it does not have a fixed size really. And all the, the layers are fully connected. So this input data, I said that the input layer is, does not have a fixed size. That is because the, the data we include in this input layer is for one, the particle offset and the velocity. So the velocity of the particles, I think is clear. The offset is the particle position minus the position of the closest cell. Uh, we use that instead of the particle position overall because we want to use only local information. Uh, yeah, and the particle position, uh, the global position would tell the neural network where the particle is, which uh, is something we want to avoid. Uh, we also include different fields. So those are the fields that we include, the mass, pressure, stress from eases, momentum, velocity, local force, force, stress, and strain rate. Uh, yeah, I, I skipped the definitions for most of those because, uh, well, I, I don't think we really need them to understand the, the results. And yeah, we don't include all of them at the same time. Uh, we, we, uh, yeah, we'll get to the results in a bit. We include one, one field at a time and see how the results change. 
And then the output data, as I said, is the displacement deviator, the three components. So we also need a loss function because we have labeled data. Uh, it's pretty easy to define. We just use the mean square error between the prediction y, uh, yp of the model and the true values, the, the labels, uh, which is yt for true. And then just the, the mean square error of the components. Uh, this is, however, not really by what we uh, by what we judge the performance of the network. For that, we have the mean square error of the displacement deviator. And those two are, well, they are very similar and they are very closely related. However, our labels and our model output, they are standardized to have a standard deviation of one and a mean of zero for the entire data set. Uh, we have to do this to make the, the training more stable. What we actually want to predict is, of course, the displacement deviator. And this is uh, the error we truly want to be small. And well, this is defined per sample. Uh, we don't want to minimize this value only for a single sample, but for the entire validation data set. So we just take the mean uh, of, of those values for every sample. And then to we need some kind of comparison to say if this is a good value or a bad value. So we also introduce a very similar uh, quantity for uniform motion. So we can calculate the hypothetical error that we would get for uniform motion. The uh, displacement deviator in that case would be zero. And then we, we are only left with the true displacement deviator. Uh, we take the squared mean of those. And this is what we compare our performance against. And we can simply do that by dividing the, the error that we get by that of the uniform motion. So whenever this eta value is smaller than one, we know that the prediction is better than what uniform motion would get, give us. And the smaller it is, the better it is. Uh, yeah, then we get to the results. So as I said, we include different fields while trying to make our predictions. And those are the values that we get. So if we include no fields at all, we get 0 0.86, which is still better than uniform motion. And that can be explained because we do have some input data to the network, which is the particle offset and the particle velocity. It's just no, no fields. So that is better than just including no fields at all. But we also have some fields with a value that is even smaller. Uh, that is 0 0.65 or around that. And this is actually the same if we include some some of the fields, for example, the mass field, or we include all fields at once. Uh, yeah, this is what I just said. So what this tells us is that we, if we include, for example, the mass field uh, in the input data of the network, we actually improve the, the predictions over uh, when we don't include any fields at all. So there is value in calculating the fields at all, but also that a lot of the information seems to be, to be redundant because if we uh, include all the fields that lead to this improvement, we don't see any, any further improvement beyond that. Uh, so it would be, so we get the same result if we include either only the mass or all the fields. Uh, I'll talk a li little bit more about that in the conclusion. So we also want to know now where the errors stem from. We know that the prediction is better than uniform motion, but we still don't know why the prediction is not perfect. Uh, of course, we would not expect it to be perfect, but we want to know why that is. Uh, so I've rendered another video where I mapped the particle color to the prediction error, and we can look into that and maybe slow it down a bit. And you can see 
many of the large errors occur in the surface flow, um, especially where the particles hit the drum. Uh, but well, with this video, we can only really make qualitative statements. So, uh, well, it's it's not really surprising that where the particles hit the drum is uh, the error there is large. Uh, this is actually what we expect because the drum uh, is invisible to the entire cost graining process. We don't add to the mass field where the drum is and I think we're not even looking at contacts between the, the particles and the drum. So, uh, and the drum, that obviously causes an acceleration to the particles by an invisible object. And the displacement deviator is directly related to the av average acceleration over a time step, uh, which is this H bar, uh, A bar. And yeah, because this is acceleration by an invisible object. The true displacement deviator will be large, but the model has no way of predicting that. Uh, next, we look at the overall error distribution. So we, we have smaller errors to the left, larger errors to the right. And on the y-axis, we have the relative frequency of those. Uh, and this is a log, log plot where we find that it is approximately a line. Uh, this tells us that the error distribution will take form uh, like this. And from the, the slope of the, uh, yeah, from the slope of the histogram, we get this factor of minus four thirds. This is just a rough estimate. Uh, usually what you would want to do is not, not really have a histogram, but a kernel density estimator, I think, and then actually fit a line to that. Well, this is just, well, I just counted. Uh, yeah, this gives us a rough estimate of the error distribution. I didn't really interpret that very much. Uh, I wanted to compare it to the error distribution we would get with uniform motion, but unfortunately, uh, I just didn't have the time for that. Then. Next, we look at the predicted displacement deviator versus the true displacement deviator. So on the x-axis, we have the true displacement deviator and on the y-axis, the prediction. And in the ideal scenario, of course, the prediction would exactly equal the true displacement deviator. And this is shown by this diagonal line. Uh, this is what we want ideally. Uh, we can see that this is definitely not the case. Uh, we do have some horizontal elongation in our uh, blobs of data points, uh, both in the Z component, but also in the X component. This tells us that the model generally tends to underestimate the, uh, the magnitude of the displacement deviator. Uh, that the, the true value is larger than the prediction. Uh, but we can also see that there's some clustering around the diagonal. So the highest values within these blobs are, and also within this vertical line, they are basically spot on on the diagonal. And also we can see that uh, the Y component is very small. Uh, this is to be expected because as you've seen before, there is basically no movement along the axis of the, the drum, which is the Y component. Yeah, uh, with that, we come to the conclusion. So as I've shown, the fields do actually improve the predictions of the model over not including them at all, which is good. Otherwise, this whole thing would have been mostly pointless. Uh, this could in the future maybe prove useful for accelerating granular physics if we can. So this has the potential to uh, replace uh, solving the, the particle dynamics, at least in some part, with just computing the fields and then propagating the particles with this model. Uh, this model is very good for generalization because we use only local 
local fields and local information of the particles, uh, we could basically train the scene on one system, for example, this drum, and then apply it to very different systems because the, the local physics, they should not change very much. Of course, we could uh, improve it by training it on different scenes from, from the beginning and then applying it to even more different scenes. The question, the main question I had for that is if there are any fields that we can define that would improve the predictions further. I have actually defined a field in my thesis, which uh, is the granular temperature. And I would guess that this is a good candidate for uh, maybe improving this uh, prediction accuracy. However, uh, because of time constraints mainly, I did not implement the granular temperature in the final version. Uh, this is definitely something to look uh, to look into into the future. Uh, and also, we might just try and slapping different particle or contact properties together and just try and see if we can create some some synthetic field that uh, improves the predictions. And then only only if we find a field that does that, uh, try to interpret it. Uh, yeah, another conclusion, or rather uh, something I think we all know is that neural networks are black boxes. That makes it very hard to really interpret the results uh, and especially makes it hard to interpret the errors of the model. So uh, yeah, one question is, can we optimize this model? Uh, optimize the number of layers and the size of the layers. I only did some some manual tweaking. You could definitely uh, do some some hyperparameter uh, tweaking to try and find a better model. And also, which I think would be uh, more fruitful is to see if we could replace the network, the neural network, with some kind of statistical model, uh, because then we could probably make more uh, more relevant statements about the errors and where the errors come from, we could we could backtrack more uh, and then try to improve upon those. Oh yeah, and that's actually it. Thank you, thank you. Applause from everybody, I'm sure. <laughs> um, thank you, Klaus. Uh, thanks for a great presentation and thank you for a great thesis and work overall. Um, it's uh, very interesting, of course, <laughs> uh, and it's uh, well, well written, uh, well presented. You make it uh, very clear, easy to follow, easy to understand, and that's an art. Uh, part of that is is that you write the thesis rather brief, brief, which I mean makes it increases readability. You could easily have put in lots of more material in in there, uh, which would make it harder to read. Uh, but there are some things that I think you're leaving out that I think you should have, uh, you should consider having it there. Uh, one thing is um, motivation of the work. You, you mentioned it here in the conclusion. Why, why is it interesting, this the coarse graining? Uh, you give here one example uh, in, in combination with the predictor model to accelerate physics. There are some other aspects of coarse graining also. So I, I think you should add some one or two sentences of motivation. Why? Why is this interesting to to investigate and find new solutions for? And also mentioning previous work. Something has been done in this area before. Probably uh, it didn't take it all away, because you're <laughs> you're you're adding a new study to it. So you should also explain how previous work falls short in in accomplishing that. Mm. You, uh, important and valuable part of your work was that you created a C++ library, uh, quite optimized uh, and available uh, at GitLab. And you don't mention that in the thesis no. uh, at all. And describing the, the, the library, it's, uh, its design and design principles and everything, that's maybe, I mean, that's done on the Git repository, so you don't have to repeat it. But I think you should at least mention it <laughs> Uh, in, a, in a section that it exists. Uh, and um, I mean, uh, that's a great addition that you have done. You have accelerated these computations compared to the solution that we, we previously used. Um, 
and speaking of that, it would be also very interesting that you put some numbers. You do a complexity analysis of the of the of the methods, and you have succeeded in implementing it. Uh, that it has the same complexity. You haven't added anything that ruins that complexity, and, and that's good. Maybe you should show uh, demonstrate some evidence for that, and then also uh, some examples of how fast you can do certain competition on some test system. Because now we can only see the complexity, but not the prefactor of actually how fast it is. Yeah, I've actually uh, done. And I, I had actually done that before, but because the library kept changing and changing, I those benchmarks were outdated. But you can actually see that this complexity does hold true. Mm. Yeah, but but also the prefactor, so that one can estimate the actual actual speed, uh, which is important. If when you do post processing on a very large system, so that you you can predict with, will this be uh, manageable in certain time, or should I move to a supercomputer? And also when it comes to this predictor model with the neural network, it's interesting to know how how rapid is the field computations here? Uh, are they a bottleneck here, or what would be the bottleneck in a data driven simulation model? We have to compute the fields every time step and also have in, do inference, in, infer, inference on the neural network model, which where is the bottleneck? And then it's interesting to know how rapid is the field computations. Um, I, I move on here a little. I, I really have to move at, uh, leave at two o'clock. So I, I try to be rapid here. Mm, moving over to... Um, Looking in the thesis, figure 12, uh, the strain rate field. Mm -hmm. uh, you have it in the slides also. Uh, so we have the velocity field, and then we have the strain rate tensor. Wait, and I'm can, a I little surprised. Yeah. Did I say 12? Um, wait, which, which one did you say? Figure 12, I think. Ah, figure. Strain rate. Yeah. Uh, then, yeah. Yeah, so if we scroll up to the velocity field. Yeah, there, figure 11. So there I see a transition from red to blue. Uh, so the particle is moving in different direction, and there's a transition in the center where it's white. So I would expect a strain rate. I mean, so it's clearly sharing here in, in x, z direction. Uh, so, and I would expect a, a pretty clear strain rate from that in figure 12. But I, I can't, can't really see it. Uh, and the y-axis is the axis of the drum, or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I have the same expectations. For some reason, we have uh, we mostly see something on the very surface. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that is because the particles that move uh, where no, no, actually, no, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So one explanation is that we you have the the fluctuations on the surfaces and that dominates the stream field and then everything else gets to, uh, like uh, hidden by the by the scale so either either separating filtering out that and zooming into what happens in the bulk so that we can actually confirm that uh, I, I mean right now that makes me suspicious is there an error in the strain rain field or is it just hidden because of the noise at the surfaces so that's something i would like to understand. Mm. Yeah, I can skip that one. Is this a slice from the center of the uh, of the uh, cylinder? Yeah, it's uh, taken from the very middle. Yeah, then taking. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned here on a Slack conversation, the stress field. So we have the kinetic stress and the contact stress. And as I understand, you add them together. So when we look at the pressure and the von Mises stress, it is the sum of the, the kinetic yep. and contact stress field. And that, I think that makes it 
harder for the model to learn because it mixes from the forces. And the flow is all represented by the velocity field. So I think the model have a better chance of succeeding if you would train it only on the contact stress field. I agree. Uh, I've looked into the data again. Uh, the kinetic stress actually dominates the overall stress. So the, the contact stress is pretty much, much just masked by, by the kinetic stress. Mm. Uh, if we include just the, the contact stress, yeah, I, I agree that there might be a chance to, to improve the predictions uh, further. Uh, this is like one of the fields that I mean with trying to find some, some combinations that improve the results. Mm. Um, yeah, I have some other questions, but I think they are of less importance. So I, I open up for other people also that I can return if there is, <laughs> if there is time, but please go ahead from your other. Uh, yeah, I would, questions. Uh, yeah, I was also also thinking about the kinetic and the contact stress. Uh, and as far as I understand, if for example, if you have a very heavy machine on a soil, then the stress is uh, dominated by the contact stress, and the kinetic stress is kind of a minor refinement. Uh, and also, as far as I remember, we disincluded the kinetic stress in the previous version of the course grading. Um, right, Martin? That we neglected it? Yeah, the, the kinetic stress. Uh, at some stage it was computed, but uh, when we uh, all analysis was done only on the contact stresses. Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, but in this case where we have this rotating drum, you said that the kinetic stress is the dominating stress. Yeah. Okay, interesting. I guess it's just because, well, the particles move a lot compared to when you have static medium where a uh, vehicle drives over uh, where there's very little movement, but large forces. Okay. Um, and just a quick question about the mass conservation. Uh, maybe I didn't follow every part of it, but could it be feasible to solve this by, uh, if you count all the particles in the systems and, uh, and you log all the radii and the actual mass of each particle, and then you compute the actual total mass. And then by using that data, uh, you introduce a small constant so that uh, mass is conserved, or would that not work? Uh, yeah, you could do that. You could uh, calculate the, the total mass of the particles first, then calculate the conventional cross graining, and then uh, just calculate the, the quotient between the, the total field mass and the total uh, particle mass and just multiply it and um, yeah then then you have the values distributed as if they were coarse grained but scaled such that they overall give the the total mass yeah uh, you could totally do that uh, cool yeah that's all for me and also uh, thanks for a very clear and um, structured uh, presentation it was uh, uh, enjoyable to hear thanks uh, glad to hear that Okay, I, I have a question, if there's okay. time. Uh, so you mentioned it briefly that, I mean, the, the particles were in a sense not aware of the drum, so they, they don't sense the drum. Uh, do you have in, any idea or intuition for a way to solve this problem for like a, because you use a local model. So is, is there, do you have any intuition of how to provide this information to the particles? I do have some ideas, yeah. Uh, one solution would be to uh, just give the particle a mass and some properties of itself and include them into the field somehow. Uh, for example, you could model the, the drum as lots of small particles to form this, this shape. Uh, or what you could also do is you could uh, introduce the context between the particles and the drum into the contact fields which is not done here. I'm not even sure if uh, AGX does it, does compute those contacts uh, or how, how yeah. it does that. Yes. Uh, yeah, but, the forces are there. So it's just to include them in the context stress field. Yeah, uh, that might also be an option.
Yeah, I should another question. Uh, I, since it wasn't said explicitly, I assume that the fields and and the yeah the fields are time instances. Yep. It's uh, there is no time averaging. Uh, have you considered that? Uh, because I mean, you, you get some noisiness from particle, from from the particle. In, I mean the particle noise. So it, the fields will be noisy. And if you did did some time averaging, they would be smoother. And maybe that would give you, would give a more reliable model. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not saying it would, <laughs> because there are, you can argue for the other way as well. Because these fluctuations are important to capture to get a precise particle position. But have you tested it, and have you considered it, and do you have any arguments? Uh, no, actually, I, I have not considered it at all. Uh, this is always just instances of the the field. Of course, you could only use past field data and smooth from there. You could not not include the future field data. Uh, and yeah, you might actually be able to define some some new fields once you include multiple time steps. Uh, maybe the the difference of the velocity field from one step to the next or something like that. Uh, that might also be useful. I can I can imagine that time averaged fields plus granular temperature that represents the level of fluctuations. The combination of the two would reach further, possibly. Yeah, yeah. I also think that the granular temperature, uh, especially or something similar, uh, I would use the standard deviation of the particle velocities personally. Uh, I, I think that could help prove it. Mm. Yeah, uh, Volker, turn this camera on. Do you have a question? No, I've just uh, been away for a while, so came back. Sorry. Another question: um, the, in the in the particle stepping uh, that you present, it's basically forward Euler. Uh, the new position is predicted using the previous position and the velocity at at the previous time step, and that that can be formulated in other ways that are equivalent in the in the limit of the infinitely small time step. But there, so there is also an opening of of doing a prediction that that reflects that the field velocity field is not uniform that would that's an opening for pushing the precision even further that's something you have considered i i'm not following yes yeah, so in a in a stepping equation uh, equation number it on, on on the slides yeah, either, either, either or. Um, there. There. So equation 22, for example. Uh, so you use, uh, so we have prediction of next position is uh, 23. Next position is the old position plus the velocity times time step plus delta k. And that velocity, according to 22, it's evaluated at the previous time step. Yep. Uh, it, uh, and right, it is the particle velocity. It's, you don't use the field there. Yep. Right. So all the fields should, should contribute to it. Ah, okay, so I, I mixed mixed uh, mixed things in my mind. I was thinking velocity fields were involved here, but everything is kept in the in the displacement matrix key. So ignore. Sorry, I was okay. thinking differently. Uh, yeah, so I have a car waiting for me now, now to move. So again, uh, very big. Thank you for all the work and the great presentation today. I will I will send you now when I'm at the computer again uh, my my comments in in written for, written form and we can uh, we can discuss um, over over email or meeting uh, next week uh, uh, the final conclusion of of everything. All right. But um, thank you and uh, happy midsummer, everybody. Yeah, same to you. Thanks. Happy midsummer. Same. And 
Thank yeah. you, guys. Bye.